Egyptian just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome to the Time Shifters Podcast. This is Christopher here, as always, with my good friend Tom. Tom, how are you tonight? Good. How are you doing? Other than my technical difficulties that we've been enjoying for the early part of the evening. You know, that happens to one or the other. Any any podcaster has, has felt that pain uh, at one point or another. It just... That is just the nature of this beast. Absolutely. You just hate to have it happen right when you're trying to get the thing started. Well, I tell you what, let me get this out of the way first. I often forget or just don't bother to mention the uh, link in the show notes that will lead everybody to all our different social media and email. Fortunately, somebody actually did indeed follow that link and sent us an email uh, Matt, of course, former co-host of the Time Shifters podcast, actually is the one that sent this email in. Hi, Matt. He just recently listened to our League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, episode. He says he thoroughly enjoyed it. I didn't realize that was the movie that effectively ended Sean Connery's film career. Even if it was his choice, it's a kind of shame considering how much people enjoy that movie now. But you guys commented how you didn't see Moriarty's plan making sense. While the movie did explain why he brought them together, I like to imagine it is that because he's he's James Moriarty and wanted to see if he could beat them. And there's no mention of Sherlock Holmes in this, and I wonder if he's killed him already and wanted to take on a bigger challenge. The other part that I like so much is that Sawyer wasn't meant to be on the team, and it was his bonding with Quartermain that led to Moriarty, Moriarty being stopped. Sawyer takes the shot that kills him, preventing his escape with the means to try again. It's something Moriarty couldn't have accounted for and a clever ending, and the whole thing seemed intentional to me. Interesting take. I like that. That you know, we, we were saying, why, why would you pull this group together and to try to stop you? Well, maybe he really thought he could outwit them, and maybe that was his challenge. And it was Tom Sawyer's <laughs> interference that uh, tipped the scale. That's fair. I th- thought we actually brought up that we may have contrived that Moriarty was looking for a challenge. But beyond that, um, yeah. But you have to bring a lot of baggage to the film to get to, <laughs> to that. So uh, Matt does finish his email uh, with a little, he said, that's my feedback, but here's a request and it's your call. If you want to read this part, well, I'm going to go ahead and read. I want to put it up to you here and let it uh, see what other people think. In keeping with the theme of, well, it looked pretty. I'd love to discuss the movie Willow from 1988 with you guys. Now I didn't consider that one cause I was afraid that would be a lot of like hard, uh, pushback is to like us saying, or given any kind of indication that that's not like a good film. I actually thought everyone really liked that movie. I've never had a strong opinion either way. I think I've seen it once in my lifetime, but it's not one of those that, like when they announced uh, that Disney Plus was going to do a Willow series, I was more like, why? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um who who's asking uh i was i'm not aware of a huge willow following that could just be me uh i think it's a little telling that uh willow got its first season on disney plus and is canceled going into a second season there's no second season so kind of sticks with my why <laughs> so um, might be worth uh, just on that point alone. Yes, I think maybe it might have done well, but I just don't see that being the that film that stuck with people for years to come. 
Interesting. You know, I kind of always thought that that was that'd be the one that people really uh, enjoyed, and I I don't know, maybe that would have fit the uh, fit the theme. I I can't recall whether I've actually watched that film or not. I think it's always been on that list mm-hmm. to either watch or and or revisit, and it's just not one that I've gotten around to. Well, I, if we want to squeeze it into the calendar, I'm game. Uh, as long as you feel it fits our theme well enough. And given this little debate, it might. It might indeed. I, I, I definitely think there might be a film or two on the list that we currently have that could be replaced with something like this. Well, the funny part, uh, and that's what's really intriguing about this particular, uh, this is a very meta style topic uh, to, to, to suggest, well, it looked pretty, that as they say, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. So, so <laughs> this is a very subjective conversation <laughs> either way. So to hear from uh, from a former co-host uh I, i'm game that we could do that all right well we'll look into that we'll see if we can't schedule something uh he also wanted to let us know and i think this is pretty exciting that he is actually starting a new podcast that centers on movies he's he's currently been doing a podcast uh, around the uh, series supernatural season 14 time for a podcast yeah which started like what two or three seasons before they actually ended the show (laughs) i think i think he was thinking season 14 there can't be any more after this right but uh they kept making them but anyway so he's in the uh in the middle of that podcast but he he wanted he's been uh just itching to jump back into the movie theme podcast so he's going to be starting one i believe they're gonna kick it off in may so i'm really excited to see what he and his friend come up with awesome I believe this thing is going to be called Good Movie, Bad Movie. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what that means. I have an idea, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that should be a lot of fun. So uh, congratulations, Matt. Welcome back to the movie podcast fold. Absolutely. And as you grow that, let us know. We'll always happily guest host. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I hope there's extra chairs. <laughs> And fire us a promo as soon as you got one. There you go. So outside of that, yes, what have we been doing? It's been uh, kind of a slow couple weeks for me. You know, there's been a little bit of news. I I, I saw an email just recently from uh, Full Moon. Oh, wow. You know, Full Moon Direct announced that they were going to be putting out a fifth film in the subspecies franchise. I wondered what kicked off your subspecies run. Yeah, this this will be coming out this June. Subspecies 5, Blood Rise. And this is going to be like a prequel film, which explores the kind of rise and fall of Radu. It's reuniting the uh, producer Charles Band with director Ted uh, Nicolou. It's also bringing back Anders Hove, who played Radu, and actress Denise Duff, who played Michelle in the second and third films. I don't remember if she went on to the fourth film or not Mm. Uh, but she plays a uh, a new character she's obviously not playing Michelle because this is a prequel Uh, but uh, I saw the trailer from this thing and I was like this actually looks like it's going to be kind of (laughs) cool but it did give me kind of uh, jonesing to go back and watch the first film again and uh, the the whole email was just saying that you know hey the first film's available on full moon direct for free you know in celebration so like that's fine that's cool I have it on DVD, so it's free whenever I want to watch it. <laughs> this isn't the first time I've watched it like in a long time, but it's been several years. I still really like these films. This is like prime full moon entertainment. The early 90s yeah. was just a great time for full moon. And these films have a lot going for them. Yes, they were a lot of low budget. And yes, maybe they were kind of biting off more they could chew than with you know, tail and a vampire tail or whatever. But overall, I think they really do pull out a pretty decent series of films. Yeah, I haven't seen uh, much of the full moon in a while. Not since you and I used to watch them all, all the time. So uh, I might have to check those out again sometime myself. Weirdly enough, I think the second film is the better film between at least the first two. Yeah. 
um, artistically for sure, they do some really cool things with like light and shadow in that second film to sort of uh, get around budget constraints. There's some really great effects with, you know, they, they can't afford to have, uh, you know, vampire transformations or uh, having Radu flying through the air or anything like that. So what they do is they have just uh, elongated shadows stretching across the, the, the buildings and these Romanian streets. And then suddenly Radu will be, will appear. And it's a, it's a really great way of like, oh, okay, he transformed it like to a shadow and then moved from one spot to another. I love it. I think it's really cool. And um, yeah, I know. I really enjoy his films. I, I need to get into the third film. Um, it's been a, quite a while since I, I know it's been a quite a while since I've seen that one. So it's it, it's a fun series, and I, I'm really looking forward to this this fifth film. It, I'm hoping I will get a chance to watch it, you know, sooner rather than later. And I do believe I will probably go ahead and add it to the collection <laughs> just because it's subspecies and it's you know full moon. Sure. No, uh, I, now I'm gonna have to get caught up again. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll have to loan you the uh, the discs. There you go. <laughs> Or you can I don't I don't know how the Full Moon Direct works. I don't know if I think it's a subscription service, which is kind of unfortunate. I I don't know if they have any you know streaming with ads or anything available. Hmm. I haven't I haven't checked that out. It'd be I know a lot of the Full Moon Full Moon films are on Tubi, so if you don't mind some ads, you can go and watch them on there. I watched uh, Arcade not that long ago, and I think the Doctor Mordred is on there. I could have sworn I recently watched the Trancers film. Well, not recently, <laughs> a couple years ago. I watched at least the first two Trancers films. Yeah. I assumed I had them, like copies of them, or had at least the first film. Not, not, not that I can find anywhere. So I must have watched them. Maybe I had a like a free trial for Full Moon Direct or something, or maybe I watched them on Tubi. I'm, I'm not sure. But that's a series I, I kind of embarrassed and shocked that i don't own that series on dvd <laughs> no popping out here to full moon direct yeah it just looks like a uh, a sales site so hmm okay yeah I, I i think they have somewhere maybe it's not full moon direct maybe i i i'm pretty sure they have a streaming service somewhere uh an app you know roku thing or or, or something my my favorite thing out here, though, uh, as I'm just poking around while you're talking, is that they have an entire section for Give the Gift of Full Moon. <laughs> the, the first uh, five things to purchase under their new stuff section is Give the Gift of Full Moon. Nice. <laughs> That's too funny. I'll have to make sure to put that on my like uh, Christmas wish list, though. Well, yeah, because it comes in denominations of 25, 50, 100, 200, and 500. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's a lot of investment in full moon. I better get a credit on a film. <laughs> I am a fan of those early full moon, the early 90s. They are, in the end, towards the mid to late 90s, I think they were trying to like out trauma trauma. They were making the films that were just sort of ridiculous for re- for the sake of being ridiculous. I mean, they were kind of like the Sharknado 5 of their day. Yes, quite. But early on, I really feel like they were trying hard to actually make entertaining films. And I enjoyed the hell out of them. You know, the the subspecies, the puppet masters, trancers. Granted, trancers, like, that is a series with diminishing returns. (laughs) (laughs) I think by the time they made uh, film six or seven, I mean... They couldn't even get uh, Tim Thomerson back. <laughs> when you can't get your star back to do the film, that he's done five or six of these things, and you can't get him back to do this next film, you've now made one too many Trancers films. <laughs> oh, no way. I didn't even realize that uh, the, uh, a movie that I'm fond of from the Mystery Science Theater perspective, uh, Laser Blast. Laser Blast. Yeah. Didn't realize that was a full moon movie. Well, it's not, but it's a Charles Band production. Ah, that was pre Full Moon. It might fall under his Empire Pictures, which uh, I think technically the first Trancers was an Empire Pictures. Gotcha. So it didn't fall under the Full Moon label just 
it is a Charles Band production, so you will find it on. I guess he he still owns the film, so you will see it. I it may kind of get distributed under Full Moon now, but when it was produced, there was no Full Moon. Well, rush out to their website and you can pick up the collector's edition. <laughs> Yes, I, I I I saw that. Yeah, they said they had a box set that was like the first decade of Full Moon. I'm like, oh, what's that? It it's not even the films. It's all pre Full Moon technically. It's all Empire Pictures and Charles Band productions that aren't actually Full Moon films. I'm like, eh, not the same not thing. The same thing no. <laughs> I want the Full Moon. That sounds funny. The more you say it, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to be said for Full Moon. You, they kind of um laid the groundwork for special features. If you remember at the end of all their, their VHS days, when they released these things, they had their full moon video zone. Yes. A little like 20 minute, maybe half an hour short. That was usually uh, about, you know, kind of behind the scenes of the film you watched or uh, upcoming. Yes. Uh, it, I, uh, I remember upcoming features that from those sections. I always thought yeah. that was fun. So they were like, special features before special features were a thing when DVDs came around. So I thought, you know, that that's actually pretty cool. No, that 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 made them half the fun. As I've said many times, I I was a huge fan and I've got the mug, the hat and the t-shirt to prove it. <laughs> well, but weirdly not all that many of the films. <laughs> I, I if I recall correctly, we would even create our own stickers of the logo back in the day. Did we? We might have, we might have done, or I might have actually had one because I was like in that full moon fan club or something like that. There is that, yeah. One way or another, I know we had a, a, a series of the stickers of the full moon logo. I probably still have one floating around somewhere. Oh, I'd love to have it. I got to see if they, they still offer those because the back of my car, all the little, my, my car's tramp stamps. <laughs> I need a full moon. <laughs> Again, sounding a little funny. <laughs> <laughs> that that is pretty much all of uh, all of note that I've really been watching. Um, we talked briefly before we started recording that you you've just sounds like you've just been kind of just keeping up on some television shows yeah, and stuff. Yeah, it's mostly been uh, it, it's just been pretty busy lately. Uh, the deeper we get into uh, Picard third season, the the more I'm loving it. So, I, I know others will have other opinions, I'm sure, but uh, the this last episode ahead of our recording um, finally got the entire Next Gen cast back together and in the same room, and it just kind of felt right. So, cool. I, I think I'm a little behind. Yeah, so... I won't spoil a thing, but yeah, no, just been thoroughly enjoying that. The, the part that on the other side, uh, been keeping up with the Mandalorian, and much like a lot of folks out there, this season is not hitting home very well. So, no, oh, interesting. Um, it's kind of like a show that has lost its way. So, <laughs> this is not the way. <laughs> this is not the way. It it, it gets kind of bad, uh, and, and this has been a thing. Disney and Star Wars has been doing lately where, okay, the show is called The Mandalorian, but The Mandalorian is not the star of his own show right? half the time. And they did that back with uh, the book of Boba Fett as well. Um, anyone that watched that, most of the good stuff in that, in that series was done not including Boba at all. So... It's a weird trend. <laughs> yeah, it's very strange. Yeah. Um, I have continued my sort of hate watch of the arc. <laughs> yeah, how's that going? I, I, I think I'm coming up. Um, I think the next episode I'm going to watch is the season finale. One can only hope. Apparently it has been renewed for a season two. Oh, you are I, kidding. <laughs> I, I feel a little guilty that I may have played a part. <laughs> Uh, I, I will, unless this finale does something that just absolutely blows my mind, yeah, I will not be continuing it into the second season. That is it's just some of the most mundane, overused tropes in any 
sci-fi series ever. And I just, God, there's just nothing original about that show. And I, it's real unfortunate. I think the premise is rich. Sure. I think the premise is fantastic. They just have not done anything worthwhile with it, in my opinion. Since this thing got renewed, I'm going to challenge you with something. You've made it through the first season, basically. Yeah. Um, I challenge you to take on the second season from the perspective that a lot of times shows need time to develop. We all use the example of Star Trek The Next Generation anyways. If you were to base the entire series on the first season, the show's garbage. <laughs> but yeah. it it grew up. Um, it learned some lessons and it it put built in better writing, better acting. It it just got better. Uh, and unfortunately, it required removal of Gene Roddenberry um, <laughs> as the yeah. showrunner. Um, and then that that fixed it. Um, maybe the people out there that make this thing have been paying attention to some of the really harsh critique and may get a chance to fix it. Yeah, I mean, when you put it that way, it, it does seem like if I've made it, if I've done this and if I'm going to critique and base the entire thing off just what I've seen. Yep. With it being renewed, that is true. It does not seem terribly fair. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you in for penny, in for pound. <laughs> because I've, there has been series, I remember, um, oh, back in like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yep. That first season was, it was just okay with me. Right. And I stuck with it. And found myself getting pulled along for whatever, whatever, five seasons or whatever that it ran, and loving every minute of it. Yep. Um, so you got to at least venture into the second season. Granted, that's probably yeah. a full year away. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got time to forget it, <laughs> forget about it. I, I I won't ask that you go and rewatch the first season ahead of the second season. Go ahead and let that just soften in your brain. No, I, I probably won't have to because, as I said, all the plots I've seen so many times <laughs> that hard hard to forget something that you've seen a dozen times already. Yeah, you just... I, I never made it past the first episode just based on how offensive I found the, the, the show, so... And you didn't give me a whole lot of reason to continue. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't really stopped. And it really, f some uh, events that have happened recently kind of fall well into your theory that this is written by someone who really hates younger people. Actors got to work and young actors really got to work. So you do mm -hmm. what you get. Um, so, but I don't know how they don't read the scripts for these things and go... Really? That's what you want me to do and say? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe lack of experience that doesn't... There is <laughs> something. that. Like I said, young. They are young, so... But they're not that young. <laughs> no, it depends. Some are, some aren't. Very true. Um, yeah, but I've been really bothered by the, the, the events recently where, in one way or another, it is the older generation that is kind of come to save the day oh god <laughs> all right so folks if you're out there and you're listening to us please take take this stuff to heart you are offending an entire generation in, in how you're writing <laughs> yeah. this give them a little bit more credit <laughs> yeah whether you know it or not it it, it may be a, a little subversive but yeah i i think it's happening yeah so may may maybe mature your your dialogue and your plot and your characters, for God's sakes, let's try to give them a little more dimensions than half of one. We will see what happens. I'm, I am a little curious what they decide to do with this character they introduced about midway through the first season. I don't like this character. <laughs> She's kind of like um, a henchman to like the big bad. Mm. But she's also the daughter of the big bad. But the mother apparently doesn't give two shakes about her okay and 
and I, I've pretty much they're going to set her up to be like the linchpin that's going to save the day when she finally realizes how little her mother loves her, and she's going to, you know, end up uh, doing something that saves our heroes, you know, or our our crew. And it's like, okay, I know that's going to happen, but is she going to like sacrifice herself to do it, or is she going to become the uh, new addition to the crew that no one trusts? She's going to lay her hands on the controls and say, "Prete Nama." Uh, well, <laughs> anything, anything could happen because I found out she's also the daughter of the composer of the music. Ah, <laughs> a little nepotism in here. <laughs> yeah. So, great. It wouldn't surprise me to see her carry on and do the second season. Wonderful. <laughs> we shall see. Uh, yeah, no, I, I may, I, I, I may regret having tech challenged you with this, but <laughs> or you might. <laughs> yeah, a year from now, Time Shifters will be looking for its third co-host. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> At least Matt left of his own accord. I gotta, I, I gotta get fired. Damn. <laughs> well, we'll see how the rest of this year goes. We'll put you on probation. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll do better, sir. I, I'm sorry. Well, let's go ahead and take a break. Then we'll listen to a promo for another show, and then when when we get back, we're going to discuss 2003's The Core. I'm Jeff Owens. And I'm Richard Chamberlain. And we want you to join our club, the Classic Horrors Club. Every month, Richard and I host the Classic Horrors Club podcast, where we talk about our favorite subject, horror movies. Some of them are classics. We all go a little mad sometimes. And some definitely aren't. What you see is real. What's done is done, and what I've done is right. It's the work of science. But we love them all the same. We also have special theme months where we highlight the legendary stars. And we head to the drive-ins of the past every summer for exciting double and triple features. Hi, I'm Chili Dilly, the personality pickle. And we even have occasional guests. My obsession, and it is truly an obsession, I suppose, of Frankenstein the True Story dates back to when it first aired in two parts on NBC in 1973. So join the fun and listen to the Classic Horrors Club podcast today. Hosted by SoundCloud, we're available wherever fine podcasts are found. And for even more fun, check out the video companion on our YouTube channel. And remember, we sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. It was a secret government program known as Project Destiny. We're building a weapon that could generate targeted seismic events. Designed to use earthquakes to attack our enemies. I'm getting a seismic reading. It was a perfect, untraceable weapon. Destiny is a go. Until something went wrong. That's an electrical superstorm. Popping up all over the world. I'll put this as simply as I can. Everybody on Earth is dead in a year. The core of the Earth has stopped spinning. The spinning core protects us from cosmic radiation. Without it, radiation will create superstorms. Microwaves will literally cook our planet. How could this have happened? It was Project Destiny. We killed the planet. So, how do we fix it? We can't. The core is the size of Mars. You're talking about jump-starting a planet. What if we could? We're here about your legendary ship. What would it take to get it in three months? Fifty billion dollars. <laughs> You take a check. We need you to control the flow of information. You want me to hack the planet? I'm gonna need Star Trek tapes and hot pockets. You are good. Is there anything you can't do? Not that I'm aware of. You're trying to save the world. It's impossible. I came here to save my wife and children. I just hope I'm brave enough to save three. I can't wait to get into an untested ship, go to the center of the Earth, and restart its core with a thousand megatons of nuclear weapons. Then we outrun the biggest shockwave in history. Hot damn. San Francisco is in ruins. The whole West Coast is out. And it's decaying faster than we thought. Two, one. We're going in. Whoever 
whatever goes into the core is not coming back. I'm losing oxygen! Preach! We got a job to do. Let's do it. The Core is a science fiction disaster film released in 2003. The film tells the story of a group of scientists who embark in a dangerous mission to save the world from a catastrophic, catastrophic event. Strange occurrences are happening around the world, including freak weather events, birds unexplainably flying into buildings, and a magnetic disturbance causing a space shuttle to crash land. It is discovered that the Earth's core has stopped rotating, which is causing the Earth's magnetic field to fail. If it collapses completely, it will lead to the destruction of life on the planet. To prevent this from happening, a team of scientists and specialists are assembled to travel to the center of the Earth on a specially designed drilling machine with the goal of detonating a series of nuclear devices to restart the core's rotation. The crew not only has to overcome one obstacle after another on their journey, but also uh, forces much closer to home, forces that may have been responsible for the Earth's current crisis and will stop at nothing to protect themselves and keep the truth from becoming known. This film stars Aaron Eckhart, uh, along with Bruce Greenwood, Delroy Lindo, Stanley Tucci, Hilary Swank, and Alfre Woodard. You actually said it was kind of like one of those uh, comfort films for you, one you, you revisited uh, from time to time. If not revisit, at least catch it in a, in a scenario where it's on. Yes, I, I, I stop and I will watch. Interesting. Yeah, I have not watched this film probably since it first came to home video. I'm going to assume it was on DVD, 2003. Yeah. I remembered a lot of main plot points, I suppose. I remember the whole drilling machine. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember them hitting the big geode. And I remember in the end how they have to, like, separate the modules with the bombs. Yep. That's most of what I remembered about the film. <laughs> I didn't remember the disasters, what was happening. Yeah, I didn't really even remember who the cast was, to be honest. It's not like this was a film that I made made it to the theater to see. Um, but since seeing it, and I don't remember how or where I caught it the first time, but this was a film where... I remember everything about it all the time. Uh, oh, really? And I will never defend that this is a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a watchable movie. It, it can even be an entertaining movie at times. Uh, and, and you making that groan, uh, I, I, I find it hysterical. You could very easily place this in, like, the 1950s. You could... Make a tunneling machine. Uh, I I picture something more with the standard corkscrew drill off the front of it. Um, I mean, you've had things like Journey to the Center of the Earth and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So, I mean, it's right there in that kind of vein. It just puts a lot of extra pseudoscience into a, basically an adventure to go where we have never been. No, you're absolutely right. And there certainly has been tons of films made prior to this about drilling into the Earth's crust and, and the machine, the drilling machine and everything. And as soon as you said that, I'm picturing a film from probably the 1950s with a very similar, you know, idea and the drilling machine. And yeah, every every stop they make, someone dies mm -hmm. from some, you know... Uh, Oh, there's gas. Oh, there's a cave-in. Oh, there's... Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's... I think this is why this is kind of like comfort food. It's not good for you. Um, but but it has, it has that standard um, disaster movie cadence. Um, you, you can set... It's almost like a metronome. You can count off the number of minutes until something dramatic is going to happen. And then we cool down and we count them off again and it will build to the next thing and you cool down again and that's what this film does it's just a it's a soothing earworm of a movie <laughs> <laughs> what was funny you, you, you saying that though 
I watch the film and I get done. And the thing is, yes, it's watchable, but I can't say I had fun. In the end, I was like, I, really? I didn't find it fun. No, it's Aaron Eckhart. I, actually, I, 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 I'm saying Aaron Eckhart right now. And I feel bad for this guy. I mean, <laughs> um, he has actually had a successful career, but it's never really in anything great. Yeah, was, yeah, he's one of those actors. He he gets paid for a lot of stuff. I, I was gonna say, isn't he kind of like one of those actors where he's constantly getting cast in things that people are thinking are going to be the next big thing, and it isn't. Yeah, I mean, now granted, uh, he is in still to date my favorite Batman movie as Two Face, because um, his appearance in Dark Knight, he did a great job in that. But I mean, you, he's another one where. I like him, but you can. L- he, who he plays is who he plays in every film. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot of range. Yeah, I remember him as uh, wasn't he the monster in I Frankenstein? Yes, yes, he was. Yeah, or Adam Frankenstein. I, yeah, and I, I remember that film kind of falling short of the mark for me too. Oh yeah, no, it's a completely unrememberable yeah other than the fact that i remember that he was in it as the frankenstein's monster or as frankenstein yeah i remember nothing about it other than i think it was kind of like a uh more an action film than it was anything yeah it was kind of like the superheroing of the frankenstein monster right from scene to scene it's just i was watching it because i had to i just never found myself feeling like I was being pulled, like I was being pulled to that next scene. I, I It wasn't that I wanted to watch the next scene. It was just I, I had to watch the next scene because I was, you know, kind of charged to watch this <laughs> film from beginning to end. So you're saying that this isn't something you're going to turn on uh, this weekend just to relax and what? No, I, I can't say this is a film that I will ever decide to watch again unless i decide to go through a whole movie series of uh journey to the center of the earth uh, remakes <laughs> see now this is one of those uh, and like i was talking about the that metronome style to it where it just ticks off and does the next thing and the next thing and the next thing um what i do know is i i mean you know me i have a thing for vehicles when it comes to to some of my science fiction and fantasy. So, um, Virgil, the, uh, the, the drilling train, uh, for lack of a better term for it, they call, they kept calling it a ship. I had a hard time really trying to call it a ship since it's drilling. Um, Mm -hmm. but whatever you wanted to call it, I kind of like the sleekness of it. I really like the, uh, the drilling laser part. I, and, Ticking off how various members of the crew die, um, the way that it it works, they're they're memorable for me. I liked I liked the cast and the characters enough that it it, it hit me when like like Bruce Greenwood, he is like Captain Pretty Guy every time he's in in everything, and it's amazing how many military people he ends up playing. Um, well, he's got that look. He does. He's got that chiseled, authoritative kind of feel about him, where he's just gentle enough to go, I care, but get the hell out of my way and do it how I say. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so, but like when he goes out from the simplest of things, uh, because they happen to be in the middle of the geode and a, a molten rock hits him in the head and that's it. He's gone. And then. I have this thing about people sinking into lava. <laughs> the movie Volcano has one of those scenes, too. And I don't know why. I, I'm compelled by that. I'm drawn to it. So, um, and, and he's not the only one to die as a result of a heat-related uh, kind of thing. So, like, when we get down to... Uh, Braz, uh, the, uh, the the developer of the Virgil um, train, whatever, um, ship, uh, 
when he has to make a sacrifice to get the thing back up and running and he essentially he's walking through the tube and it is essentially melting him as he goes. Yes, it's 9,000 degrees. Yeah, it's one of those two where you go, ah, your suit's not that strong. It, you're gone. <laughs> but you, you kind of get past that and you just kind of watch him do his heroic march up to the point where they have to fry him because, mm-hmm. <laughs> because they got to get going again. And I don't know, uh, the, those just... Give me warm and fuzzies. I don't know why. All right. Again, it's crap. <laughs> I, I will grant you, I do like the cast. Uh, Aaron Eckhart is fine for, you know, what he has to do and, and everything. He's great. Uh, Hilary Swank is at, like, this is, like, at the top of her career, early on her career. She was, like, you know, Hollywood's new golden girl. Yes. Uh she was uh, in a, at a couple really big high profile. Started out with some high profile or some in, like an independent film that ended up being like a really big hit and like took everyone by storm. Um, so I, I think she was like a pretty major get for this film. Uh, Delroy Lindo, who played Braz, he's probably my favorite. I really liked him. He was a great character. Um, I forgot that this was Stanley Tucci. Yes, as a uh, Zimsky. I remembered the character, and I remember the character, and even even before I kind of it even like really even clicked on my head that that was Stanley Tucci. I'm sitting here thinking they they wanted someone like Kevin Spacey. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. Yeah, and then it then it actually kind of clicked in. Oh wait, no, this is an actual actor. <laughs> this is someone. This maybe have may may have been on purpose. Um, I liked him. I liked his character. If nothing else, for I, I liked his final scene. I, yes. That was actually one of the things I remembered, aside from the uh, everything else that I mentioned, the one thing that always stuck into my head was his final scene with that, with that stupid recorder. Right. Where he's he's dictating, he's, he's kind of like telling this, uh, dictating to this recorder about his experience, and then he realizes... What the hell am I doing? <laughs> as we pan over and he's got three seconds as he's cackling at himself. Right. <laughs> yes. Doing it. I remember that. I thought that was really funny. Alfre Woodard. I. She seems like to me just too big of an actress to be at a supporting player that, that sits in, in mission control. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Blows me away that that's that's what she gets to do. I, I find it mystifying here, uh, and I'm just tangenting for a moment because I'm looking at uh, IMDb here at, at their cast list, and her and, and Stanley Tucci are not actually listed. In the well, top. they're not in the on the, on the front page. Yeah, there. they're not in the front page. They're not top cast. I'm like, uh... <laughs> yeah, because say I'm I'm not looking at it, but let me guess. There's Aaron Eckhart, Hillary Swank. Probably Bruce Greenwood. Yep. And uh, oh, who played um, Richard Jenkins? How about were they? Do they have him in there? Uh, yes, he's further down. Uh, Delroy makes uh, the top four, but yeah, I'm oh, scrolling through. Yeah. I'd probably have to expand the list more to see. But yeah, Stanley Tucci's not there. They've got at least uh, what. Uh, almost 20 people here and Stanley Tucci is not in the list. <laughs> that is crazy to me. Yeah. Maybe that was by request. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. His agent came in after the fact they edited IMDB, move him down the list. <laughs> no matter what you think of it, at least they make an impact in the film. Like uh, that scene uh, at the end in particular, that's the one that does stick in my head all the time as he's laughing at himself for trying to record, uh, record his final words for posterity, just as a nuclear bomb is about to go off like six inches from him. Yes. In the middle of the earth. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no that that was just an amazing scene, and then it, it, it and then it just gets dumber from there. <laughs> and I do appreciate, and I always appreciate when you have a film like this that avoids the uh, romantic angle. There's no 
kissy scenes between our stars, even though that they're, you know, the, the final survivors are a man and a woman. There's no romance between them. No, they're even talking about what they're doing after that. And they're not making plans to see each other, although they did hint at it. Hmm. There is a moment because she's talking about going back to doing something. And he's like, oh, well, you know, I could get a cabin in that area <laughs> kind no, of thing. I missed that part. They, they, they hinted at it only lightly. But yes, no, they did not rush to make a huge dramatic romantic scene out of the whole thing. Yep, no, that always impresses me when they don't go that route in any kind of action and or disaster film. And the thing that kind of sticks with me on this one, uh, I don't even know if it's a good reason. Um, The movie doesn't go out on its heroes. Uh, It it goes out on um, one of the heroes, the uh, our our, our tech nerd rat rat, (laughs) yes, who also didn't make the IMDb main list. No, I remember uh, looking to f- try to figure out who he was and had to scroll quite a ways to to get to DJ Qualls. Yes, no, I, and I know him from other things, uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, but we cut we end the film with him at least leaking to the world first off why they were in this predicament in the first place, and here are the people that help to save us all so that was an interesting way to go out that's not not a lot of fanfare for the good guys although i i I will note the final scene as the camera pulls back earth is rotating the wrong way i didn't catch that (laughs) well damn it now i gotta watch it again (laughs) maybe 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 that's what they they would have to fix that in the sequel they were turned they're going the wrong way Oh, that's too funny. I also noticed, too, this is interesting. Another brief thing. It, it, it's weird. It's little flashes of memories that I, I remember from the first time I watched this. And I think it was because I remember watching it and then, like, reading trivia about it or uh, and goose and trivia and everything after the fact. Mm-hmm. And I remember this uh, this little factoid was there was a scene uh, midway through the film when the um, uh, the solar radiation is breaking through the atmosphere and it hits the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's a scene where a guy uh, has his arm out the window of his car and it suddenly gets burned and he pulls his arm in. Not in the film that I watched off the DVD or off of... Uh, I actually ended up watching this off of... Uh, uh, YouTube, Google, whatever it is. But the, I remember the copy that when I watched it, when that happens, you can see a, somebody walking along the street right next to him without any issue whatsoever. Oh, really? And they removed him, apparently, from future... <laughs> they fixed that little error. That's, uh, you know, that that's a that is a minor little... Th- well, not minor, but... Uh, but yeah, that that's not something I've caught in uh, prior viewings. I did read a couple. Someone pointed out that you know if these uh, th- these rays busting through the atmosphere can destroy you know the the protected steel of the Golden Gate Bridge, those cars <laughs> would not have lasted as long as they did. <laughs> no, yeah, if you could melt down the uh, the. Uh, the cables, the yeah, the the less than the less than a uh, half inch thick metal of a car is not going to be the thing that stops this. No, no. But hey, we got to see tires melt and pop, and then yeah, as they all fall fell off the bridge, they burst into flames and exploded. Right. Yeah. And that was probably the first time we've seen the Golden Gate Bridge destroyed since the 1950s that I can recall. Oh, really? Yeah. I I, I can't think of any other disaster I mean, film yeah, that took did, on... It didn't die in, like, uh, one of the earthquake films from the 70s? 
No, maybe. I don't know. I don't recall. I just I remember it getting attacked from, you know, like a giant octopus or something way back when. But uh, I'm trying to remember if there's... I, there's got to be some other uh, movie that has destroyed the Golden Gate Bridge, but this is one of the first ones that I can think of. There we go. Okay, uh, cha- challenge to the audience. Bring us every film where the Golden Gate Bridge gets destroyed. We'll make an entire year out of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> An examination of the Golden Gate Bridge going down. <laughs> yeah, the Golden Gate cast. <laughs> so why we're on to the disasters and stuff that we see. We, you know, we see the, the birds go out of control, uh, smashing through windows. Apparently, uh, the CGI guys got a little punchy and put a trout through one of the windows just as a joke. I, I didn't catch that, uh, so I, I don't know if that's the really there. Either, but I did read that. That's... that. Hey, you're going to have a lot of CGI and a lot of bored artists. You're going to give them opportunities. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of the CGI, uh, the destruction of Rome, I found that one to be pretty ropey. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> when the Colosseum explodes, there's a lot there that looks like CGI. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. And, and not a whole lot of reason to understand why that happened. But they they did like you know the, kind of the uh, the rocks and then the bricks flying at the screen, and they didn't look like rocks and bricks flying. It almost looked like that wasn't a finished render. Kinda, yeah. No, it wasn't great. <laughs> that being said, maybe they saved their money for the interior of the Earth uh, stuff because that actually does. And I think did look pretty good. The scene where we do kind of crash land on the inside of a giant geode, essentially. Um, and then the effect of uh, them getting out of the vehicle and just seeing the shimmering of all the crystal interior. That was actually kind of cool. The only problem with that is uh, this is one where, OK, yeah, we dipped in later uh, and, and we acknowledge that it's hot, but it's not hot on the inside of this geode. Well, I think it is, but their suits are capable of somehow they can withstand the pressure and the temperature, at least up to like 5,000 degrees uh, or something. Yeah, they, they said 5,000 degrees, but I mean, but this air pocket that's in the this uh, thing that that's not deep enough to be over that temperature range. I, I apparently not. Yeah, yeah no, I, I don't know. It gets a little. Uh, like I said, you can't start trying to think about this too hard. <laughs> no. Well, they try to explain so many things by going this. You know, they 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 use unobtainium. It was the first time we've heard this. So apparently. Avatar ripped that off. Yes. Uh, uh, but they, they come up with this new alloy that can take the pressure and the heat and convert it to energy. So that's how they explain that. And then they, they just, they say, well, yeah, the suits can, I guess the suits are made out of the stuff too, or something like that. Fine, whatever. But they don't address, and they never even mention the idea of the fact that there's gravity, and wouldn't gravity increase as you got closer to the core like that? I honestly don't know how gravity would work inside of the Earth. Yeah, I, I was just thinking maybe maybe that's kind of explained with the idea of the increased pressure. Maybe gravity is no different, but it's the pressure that would be changed, and then they, and they are saying that they can withstand the pressure, so maybe. I, I'm not sure. Well, and... I'll really freak you out. Um, a bit, granted, mass has a thing to do with gravity, but also our rotation is part of what adheres us to the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, the closer you get to the center, the l- less you're spinning. So, yeah. Uh, are you not getting lighter? Yeah, we, or yeah, would they be fighting the effect? I mean... I apologize to any former uh, science professors I had if I've got that wrong. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm not claiming to be an expert. Uh, I now, now, you know what? I hadn't even thought about that, and now you, that's all I'm going to think about. 
Yeah, wait a minute. Don't you do you spin? No, you, you uh, yeah. Do you spin faster or slower as you get to the center? Yeah, there's my physics and everything out the window. I don't. <laughs> no, from perspective, yet yeah, um, there wouldn't be an appearance of moving faster. I just don't know how that would impact the fact that you're moving toward the center where essentially you're reducing some of the mass. We're probably trying to explain a lot, put a lot more science in this movie, a lot more than any uh, of the production staff ever tried to. Yes, no, well, we've given this far greater effort than they did. <laughs> Although you shared a, uh, a an article, and I also I shared an article back that turned out was in the article you shared with me <laughs> that was uh, a sort of... Um, response from one of the screenwriters of the film to all the critics who complained about the science or the lack thereof in this film it was on uh i'll, I'll put a link to the show notes of this article because i think it's fantastic yeah. it was on uh ain't it cool news and this was uh who was this this was um uh, the screenwriter john rogers and uh it's a really funny article but he was complaining that this, you know some of these critics that were kind of jumping all over this stuff, and he was saying that how he had to fight to even get some of the stuff, <laughs> some of the stuff that that you didn't see. Uh, he let's say he fought for like three years to get rid of dinosaurs, magma walks, and spacesuits, and uh, a f- a effing windshield at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I pulled up the article, and I like the note in there. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, and he does like, no problem with warp drive, alien species who can't open a kitchen door, or a living liquid planet god. Yeah, but an improbable equation for a semi-solid fluid dynamics? You're the logic cops. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that goes to show how jaded and uh, fickled, I should say, how fickled some uh, sci-fi fans can be. <laughs> It, it, it is very true. I mean, we, we, when one of the biggest ones out there involves laser swords <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. that, that defy any kind of principle of physics at all. So, so, yeah, to get what it comes down to is, hey, buddy, we didn't like your movie as much as we like those other ones. <laughs> right. So your science is flawed. Theirs is OK. <laughs> so I feel for him for that. I, I, I genuinely do. I, I, that, which is why I'm not trying. As much as we're picking on some of the science, it's for the fun of it. It's not the thing that takes away from the film. <laughs> this does p- throw us to a great segue into hearing some comments from uh, some people that have seen the film, and then you, I'm sure you've dug up some fun uh, critiques as well. I didn't get a whole lot of feedback. I didn't get anything from uh, Facebook. I thought for sure someone would come up with a comment or two on the Facebook page, but nothing. Uh, over on Twitter, uh, Launching the Pilot says it's a solid end-of-the-world romp. It is a good build-up and a fun shuttle scene, but I wouldn't let any of these guys near a bowl of fruit. <laughs> and, he, and he attached a, a gif of Aaron Eckhart and uh, Stanley, uh, Stanley Tucci. Tucci burning the uh, the peach <laughs> over on uh, Reddit. On the uh, I stopped posting to the bad movies subreddit because I was getting tired of get people biting my head off because they didn't think it was a bad movie. So I just went to the, to sci fi movies. And I did get a couple of comments. Suspicious Flan 8926 says, I know it's kind of ridiculous, but I do love this movie. And Long Jumping Ty agrees with you, Tom, and says, Virgil is one of the coolest vehicles ever put to screen. It's fun. It is not bad. I, I do like the look of it. Whether or not you could actually construct that in three months, I don't know. Although I do like the fact that the interior anyway looked like it was a slapdash. It had that sense of unfinished, not quite elegant, but functional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I did, I did appreciate that. And, and it did have that was one of the cute little scenes earlier too, when they they come to Braz and they're asking him, "Oh, okay, uh, how long would it take you to build it?" 
and, and he he's like, oh, I, I could possibly do it in about 10 years and all that. He's like, uh, what would it take for three months? And he says something god awful, like three billion dollars. And then all of a sudden, there's a conversation. We take a check, and, and Eric, Aaron Eckhart's character chimes in. He's like, "Use the card. You might want to get the points." <laughs> right. Yeah. Like that was cute. I enjoyed that. Yeah. That was fun. There are there are some lines throughout the film that are actually not too too terrible and you know some of the characterizations and everything are actually pretty good i like uh they're trying to figure out plan c right (laughs) and zimsky just wants to go home he's like we failed just let's go back we're done and he's listening to him talk and he you could see there's an idea formulating in his head and he's he's debating amongst him he kind of in his head do i want to say anything (laughs) And he's finally like, God, ah, Jesus Christ. Look, <laughs> if we do this. <laughs> well, I did like it. Yeah, and the scene earlier when he gets punched. <laughs> right. Someone had to do it. <laughs> I just remembered that uh, we do have a Discord server. There was a comment, speaking of uh, listening to the last episode, uh, there was a comment over there on our Discord server from Astra Vale, who uh, actually, uh, she's one of the two hosts of a f- podcast called uh, Film Gazers. Mm-hmm. And she just actually uh, listened to the uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. She's, she says she just finished and she feels the exact same way about this one. I remember liking it, but knowing it wasn't good. <laughs> I haven't watched it in over a decade, though. Might need to revisit this one sometime soon. I always get it and Hellboy mixed up when I try to remember their plots sometimes because I would have sworn they had a fish guy in League 2. Looking forward to the next episode. I've been backtracking too and giving some listens while at work. The Waterworld episode had me dying. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for that comment. I appreciate it. Yes, no, we love to hear that. Anything more from the socials? No, that was it. Uh, believe it or not, I didn't actually uh, either due to some failures of websites like uh, Metacritic, uh, any t- attempt to go to the core uh, has returned an error. So, <laughs> Oh, interesting. So, But I do have a few here. So Elvis Mitchell of the New York Times, uh, he writes, the brazen silliness of the core is be calming and inauthentic, like taking a bath in non-dairy coffee creamer. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? I even don't even know what that means. <laughs> the Earth core's inability to turn is mirrored in the cast's inability to give the picture any spin. <laughs> like, okay. He he gave himself a little punch in the arm for that. There. Yeah, he was uh, he was particularly proud of himself for that. Um, and then Kenneth Turan over at the Los Angeles Times, he goes, if, if the core finally has to be classified as a mess, it's an enjoyable one if you're in a throwback mood. After all, a film that comes up with a rare, minimal, rare metal called Unobtainium can't be dismissed out of hand. So... Given that at the time they came up with that term and then Avatar used it later, uh, I almost right. want to go to his review of Avatar to find out, hey! <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that before. <laughs> yeah, you stole that. <laughs> um, and then our buddy Roger Ebert. Uh, I'll hate it when we get to films again where Roger has passed. Um, yeah. But Roger's always fun. I'm actually just going to read his last paragraph because it's about it sums it up. The the core is not exactly good, but it knows what a movie is. It has energy and daring and isn't afraid to make fun of itself. And it thinks big as when the Golden Gate Bridge collapses and a scientist tersely reports the West Coast is out. If you are at a video store late on Saturday night and they don't have Anaconda, this will do. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, because earlier in in his uh, review, he rattled off things like Congo, Anaconda, Laura Croft, Tomb Raider. <laughs> he, he he puts this one in the camp of those. Like, got you. Like they're action, they're they're disaster films, but they're not great. Talk about disaster films. I'll I'll put this one above. Uh, what was that one? Twenty twelve. Twenty twelve. Oh, I hate that film. <laughs> Again, it's one of those... I, I don't know. I'm drawn to disaster movies. So, yes, 2012... Well, that's, a dis- is, that's a disaster, all right. It is, but there are some fun roller coaster moments. It's just a shame that one of the roller coaster moments that they had, which made it kind of fun, they chose to completely reproduce it later in the film. Yeah. No, there there was moments in that. Uh, we'll go too far down a rabbit hole. Sure. I'll, I'll I'll stop. But uh, I think I I'm sure I've talked about that film at other points on the show. Go track it down. I don't know. I, he can't keep me down with a disaster movie. I kind of drawn to them. <laughs> I know most of them are garbage, and there are some that are really really wretched. But I still find something to have fun with them. But this is not that. That this one, not great, but it's a little infectious. And as you've been talking about it, you keep gleaning a little bit more that you kind of liked about it. Right. Yep. Fair enough. All right. Well, that is it from the critics. Then on your end. Yes. Absolutely. We'll go ahead and bring this one to a close. Next episode, we are going to jump back into the uh, fantasy realm. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a look at Aragon from 2006. First time watch for me. First time watch for me as well. All right. Well, this one should be interesting. Uh, There's a dragon, I think. (laughs) And There's a dragon and a pretty boy, and I'll be interested in your take on how this made it onto our list. (laughs) It was among the list of films that uh, were more style than substance. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> and the trailer looked pretty good. Okay. Or at least, you know, it looked like it would fit the the description of, you know, the, the topic of the theme. Okay. So. This will be fun. We've not seen yeah. this. Yeah. It, it should be a good, uh, maybe, hopefully, it'll be a good time. <laughs> and if anyone disagrees with us and thinks that this should not have been on the list for any reason... Do uh, follow the link in the show notes to all the uh, email links and the social medias and and let us know. We always appreciate uh, hearing from you. Um, again, thanks to Matt for giving us uh, uh, an email and let us know that he enjoyed the, uh, the last episode. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Bye. See ya.